to our session on beyond seizures, what are the right outcome measures? And today we are going to be learning about outcome measures from Molly, who is the administrative director of the Center of Health Measurement in the Department of Population Health Sciences at Duke University, as well as Dr. Leanne Snyder, who's a clinical research scientist at Simons Foundation. Um, so I'll hand it over to Molly first. All right. Okay. So, um, like Megan said, uh, my name is Molly McFatridge. I um, am a research program leader within the Center for Health Measurement at Duke. I'm also one of the developers of the ORCA measure, which um, ORCA stands for the Observer Reported Communication Ability Measure. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the development of outcome measures, but also um, with a specific focus on communication. So. Um, and then I just am going to quickly just give some time for my disclosures, but a lot of our work right now is funded by the Food and Drug Administration, um, and that everything that I discuss today, uh, my views are expressed as my own. Um, so just as an introduction for folks, um, several years ago, the Foundation for Angelman Syndrome Therapeutics um, came to our group asking us to develop a measure of communication ability um, because it was a high priority for their families. It was also a high priority as a clinical outcome measure. Um, and since then, we've seen that it's a high priority for a lot of different rare disease groups and a lot of different families. Um, so we noticed that there are some uh, opportunities for assessing communication in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders, and um, I'll talk about different ways that it can be potentially challenging, um, but I'll also talk about how a number of different instruments are used, and I'll also talk about some of the differences in content, data sources, and how they were designed um, for different contexts of use. And I know that um, Dr. Green Snyder will also probably be talking about some of these things, so I will go quickly over the broad things. Um, but just so that we're on the same, sort of all operating in the same understanding, um, a clinical outcome measure or clinical outcome assessment is an instrument or survey that represents um, a way of collecting information about a person's health, and it's used in clinical trials to determine if a drug or device is working. So um, the FDA really likes to focus um, it COAs on understanding how a person, a person feels, functions, and survives. Um, so first, I just wanted to provide an overview of um, some of the communication measures that are out there and sort of highlight some of the similarities and differences um, and talk about like target populations, context of use, and data sources. Um, and I think most of these will be like very familiar to um, folks watching. So um, the first one I wanna just highlight, and I will just also say that I am not an expert in any of these measures I'm highlighting. I'm just highlighting it for purposes of like a shared understanding. So the first one I'm gonna highlight is the Bailey Scales of Infant and Toddler Development. It is developed um, for use in children and um, it's intended to be administered by a trained clinician with, um, and their stated intent is that um, to determine developmental delays in children. And um, it is also assessing things outside of communication. So it's assessing um, cognition and motor and several other things. Um, so I'm just highlighting these right now, and then we'll talk about some of the similarities and differences. The next one that I think is a, um, going to be familiar to a lot of folks is the Vineland, um, and it is developed for um, use across the lifespan, and um, they have several different versions, but I'm focusing on the one that um, caregivers participate in an interview with a trained clinician, um, and it is used both as a diagnostic tool as well as a tool for um, educational and treatment planning. So a variety of uses and um, it's lo looking to assess um, activities of daily living, socialization, as well as communication. So it's those three, I think they're called some three adaptive functions. 
Um, and then the third communication tool that I think a lot of folks will be familiar with, um, and I will talk about how, again, the similarities and differences is the communication matrix. Um, this one can be filled out by uh, caregivers or clinicians like speech language pathologists. Um, and it is um, designed to understand expressive communication in children um, sort of with a spectrum of abilities. And um, specifically it's looking at some of the pre-symbolic verbal and nonverbal communication. And I will go to my next slide. So this slide, um, it is summarizing some of the similarities and differences across the measure. Um, so some things that I will just highlight, um, and I will say like, if there are questions in the chat, someone can just yell out to me what those questions are. I'm not great at multitasking. So please feel free to interrupt if that is uh, of use to you. But um, some things that I wanna highlight between all of the measures, um, the Bailey, the Violin, and the Communication Matrix, they have decades of um, clinical research and education, use in educational settings. Um, they also have normative data, so you can sort of see where people compare to others, um, which I think can be very useful for some folks. Um, and then where we start to see some differences is who can administer the measure. Um, as well as like what sort of communication modalities the measure takes into account um, when scoring skills, um, who it's designed for, and who was involved in the development process. So all of these sort of differ across the measures and it are important when we are thinking about context of use for um, how we're going to use the measure, especially like in different settings. So um, some of the limitations in existing communication measures, this is not, I will not say this is true for all the measures I just talked about, it's just like general limitations, um, that some of the measures require um, speech language pathologists or clinicians to complete the measure, and often children perform differently in a clinical setting than they do um, like with their families. And so um, if those abilities need to be witnessed in order to be given credit. Um, you know, sometimes that can be a limitation for families. Um, most of these measures are not necessarily designed as a clinical outcome, a measure to be used in a clinical trial setting. They're used um, in, to be, they're designed to be used in educational settings or um, in treatment settings, but sometimes that can be very different in a clinical trial setting, especially if you're trying to measure changes over time or like a pre and post treatment setting. Um, and then uh, I think that we are now moving to this, which I think is fantastic, but um, more and more measures are including advocates and parent advocates and caregiver advocates into the oversight and the direction of the questionnaire. Um, and I think we'll start seeing more and more of that in clinical outcome assessment. So I think that that is very exciting work. Um, some of the measures I highlighted, not all of them, but a few of them focus on verbal speech as an indicator of ability. Um, and so children who don't have verbal speech or who have different forms of communicating um, with different modalities don't get credit for all of that communication that they're doing. Um, and then I think this is most, this last, these last two points are most critical in clinical trial settings that, um, you know, children with certain or individuals with certain neurodevelopmental disorders in some of these traditional measures, they um, are scoring at the basement of the measure. And so if you're trying to see how these folks are, you know, their, their communication is differentiated. Um, if you're all scoring at the bottom, it's really hard to see how folks are different or how folks are changing over time. And so um, we just need more sensitive measures that are able to pick up on different types of, um, in this case, communication. Um, and our big um, goal in a lot of this work is just to continue to collect sufficient evidence for the quality of the measure um, in rare diseases and folks with neurodevelopmental disorders. 
Um, and so what that looks like for us is collecting a lot of qualitative data as well as quantitative data to um, just show that the measure has validity evidence in its favor. So I'm gonna just um, switch gears and talk about our um, multi-phased approach for developing the ORCA measure. Um, and this approach is informed by the um, FDA's uh, COA guidance for developing measures, um, which I think a lot of folks will be familiar with. So I will just talk about how it is in terms of the measure that we developed the ORCA. Um, so the development of the ORCA measure it is just, it is ongoing, but um, like I said, it started with um, working in Angelman syndrome. Um, and what we did is we reviewed, we started with formative research, reviewing the literature to find out what concepts of communication we wanted to measure and what concepts were um, particularly important to um, these families with Angelman syndrome. And from there, we uh, conducted concept elicitation interviews, which are qualitative interviews with, um, and we conducted 22 interviews with caregivers of individuals with Angelman syndrome, as well as six uh, speech language pathologists to help define the construct and identify concepts um, of communication ability that were important to folks. And after doing all of that qualitative data collection, um, we took all of that information and then drafted survey items um, that we would then use to test to see you know, if we are gathering the information that we want to gather. And we do that step of testing in cognitive testing. And we did um, two rounds of interviews with 12, 12 caregivers per round. Um, and that is a qualitative process, um, but very, it is less open-ended. So, um, and then in between the cognitive testing and the psychometric testing, which I'll talk about in a moment, we did a translatability review to make sure that the measure could be translated into a variety of different languages without it being, you know, without the meat of the measure being lost in translation. Uh, and then finally, um, we did some, we did psychometric testing, which is, um, we did uh, quantitative data collection with 249 caregivers. And then um, we also did a test retest to make sure that um, the measure was reliable in addition to the construct validity that the um, psychometric testing allowed us to evaluate. So I'll just provide some detail of what those steps look like. Um, so this was our initial um, model that came out of our concept elicitation interviews. And this is not what we settled on, but this is just the first step. Um, and I think the big takeaway for us, obviously, is that communication is really um, complex. And, um, you know, we saw like a variety of concepts from really basic concepts that almost everyone could do, like requesting attention or um, what else? Uh, requesting like food or objects all the way to um, much more complex, complex versions of communication, like telling stories. Um, we also in our interviews learned that folks are um, communicating using a variety of modalities. So in addition to um, verbal speech, they're also using uh, assistive devices, they're using gestures, um, they're using sounds, a lot of device or a lot of um, modalities of communication that we wanted to make sure to give um, folks credit for. And so um, here are the concepts of communication that we ended up with after um, concept elicitation as well as cognitive interviewing. Um, so we have uh, both we have um, expressive, receptive, and pragmatic communication. We're also taking into account the vocabulary that folks have. 
um, including the number of words or symbols on a device that a person uses. Um, so there's lots of, we're trying to, you know, get the overview of the types of communication the person can do. So I'm going to use um, refusal as an example because it's something that almost everyone stated that their child could do. Um, so refusing can look different to a lot of different people. And we saw it um, in terms of frequently in terms of like refusing food or refusing toys. Um, and what we did in like, to give you an idea from the qualitative process, we looked across our qualitative transcripts to see the types of examples that families gave. Um, and then we started to group those items into a hierarchy. So we started to see um, sort of like a natural grouping. So like from very, very basic refusals, for like crying or fussing, to um, more non-symbolic communication, such as like turning your head away or throwing an object, all the way to the symbolic communication that we all understand as like universal no's, as like shaking your head or um, saying no, signing no. Um, so we're starting to see these levels. And then from there, um, we put those levels into actual like question levels. So, you know, we have like level one being the most basic form of communication all the way to level three, which represents a higher form of communication. But still um, trying to keep those forms of communication like modality agnostic so that folks still get credit. And then um, this is uh, how we are scoring our measure. We used um, item response theory to score at the mastery level. And um, this slide, I will not claim to be a psychometrician. Um, I, you know, I only, I was part of this whole process, but I cannot tell you the details of what this looks like, but um, I'm happy to try and answer those questions. But just to, I just used this slide to show um, sort of the levels of communication that are represented and that we see both expressive and receptive and pragmatic forms like scattered across the levels of communication ability scoring. So if we look at the score, the score, the distribution of scores for the ORCA measure, um, which is that psychometric testing that I talked about earlier, um, we see that we're, we were super pleased with the distribution um, of this initial group. Um, so here you can see um, at the, the furthest left side of your screen are folks who scored at the basement of the measure. And we only had three individuals score at the basement. And these are individuals with the Angelman syndrome as a reminder. Um, and so, you know, with folks with a variety of communication abilities in this group, we're able to distinguish these folks. And we were able to distinguish them um, based on age as well as genotype, which um, is another way that to show that our measure is working the way that we intended or that we were hoping. Um, and so just sort of an overview of where we sort of came out with the ORCA measure. Um, we developed it uh, for caregivers of individuals with Angelman syndrome to be able to complete. Um, and folks as young as two, all the way through adulthood, this measure can be appropriate for. Um, our goal is, you know, our ongoing goal is that it's family-centered and patient-centered um, and that caregivers are gonna be the ones to complete the survey independently rather than using, um, like, a like needing to use a clinician to complete the survey. And then um, as far as context of use, we are, um, the measure was, designed to be used in clinical trials, which is separate from how some of those other measures that I highlighted earlier, like this is specifically for use in a clinical trial. And again, in terms of content, we are, we are looking at expressive, receptive, and pragmatic communication behaviors and taking to, into account the um, different modalities that uh, folks are using, not just verbal speech. And um, I am just briefly going to um, talk about uh, where we're going from here. So um, we think that 
we've gotten a lot of feedback that um, that some of the limitations that I highlighted earlier are a, you know limitations that other neurodevelopmental disorders see, other um, rare diseases see. And so right now we're looking to scale up the measure um, with a focus again on clinical trials. Um, and so we have a grant, like I talked about at the very beginning, um, a grant from the FDA to start collecting extra information on um, these various neurodevelopmental disorders. And we are partnering with Combined Brain to do that. And we're, um, we have, we're one year into the process. So um, we are in our UG3 planning phase, which just means like right now we are collecting qualitative data across 12 different neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and we are collecting um, sort of just information about how different folks communicate about things, what is meaningful communication to these families and how their communication behaviors can change over time. Um, and then we are looking to collect some initial quantitative data um, to be able to do some of that very initial psychometric testing as well in this initial UG3 planning phase. And then um, assuming that everything goes to plan, we will move into um, our the next phase, which is a three-year phase. Um, but I will say this year, the, the, the whole point is to really establish content validity of the measure, which just means that um, basically like the content that we hope to be represented is actually represented. And the way that we do that is through lots and lots and lots of qualitative interviews. So we are, um, we've started that work and we are, um, we are sort of in the middle of it right now. So it's very exciting. And like I said, um, the, the way to establish that content validity um, is that we are doing many, many concept solicitation interviews um, and asking families to describe the types of communication that they see in their children, as well as, um, you know, making sure that the content within the ORCA is representative of the communicate of communication and making sure like uh, if there are other concepts that need to be added that are currently missing. All right. And then this is my um, team at Duke. So um, I just wanna also say thanks to all of the families that have um, already participated in our research. We are very, very grateful for their time and generosity. Nope, that's great. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Leah, I'm Karine Snyder. I'm from the Simons Foundation um, and gonna be talking to you about measures in Simons Searchlight today. And, um, all of the data I'm going to be presenting to you today was prepared by Dr. Allison Holbrook. We're both clinical research scientists at the Simons Foundation. We work on the Searchlight, Simon Searchlight Project. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead here with, um, in the interest of time, um, to the goals of Simon Searchlight. Those of you who saw Dr. Jen Bain's presentation earlier on the um, Grin phenotypes, uh, heard about Simon Searchlight a little bit. And just as a reminder, um, we seek to shed light on neurogenetic conditions. We seek to collect high quality natural history data and um, build and develop partnerships between families and researchers, including industry. We also want to support clinical trial readiness efforts through meaningful longitudinal data collection that uh, addresses meaningful aspects of these rare diseases. Okay, so um, Dr. McFatridge already went into this a bit, but um, according to the FDA, an outcome is a measurable change in symptoms, development, et cetera, and typically uh, that's what you see as a result of treatment. And an outcome measure measures that change. And so for natural history data, it's a little bit different, but follows the same principles. We're seeking first to characterize a disease. Then we're seeking to characterize the disease process. So that is how it changes over time and chart the course of changes. Secondly, we want to provide a pre-treatment baseline 
to compare to. And also a natural history study allows you to identify suitable outcome measures for a future treatment trial. So some of the qualities of outcome measures that we considered in assembling the battery for Simon Searchlight, first of all, that they're patient-centered. So are they targeting important and meaningful aspects of a rare disease to families? How do they fit our population? Do they fit our condition, the conditions that we're studying? Are they appropriate? Do they measure the domains that we may want to treat in the future? Feasibility is important to Searchlight. We're an entirely online study. And so um, our measures need to be scalable. And um, also um, um, Molly alluded to this or talked about this a bit, validity and reliability. So um, does the measure, uh, me does, is it measuring what it claims to measure? That's validity and reliability. Are the scores basically trustworthy or are they noisy and unstable? And finally, um, in reviewing measures, um, it's extremely important that they have sensitivity to change and responsiveness to change. And these are terms in psychometrics and measure development that refer to essentially, um, there, there are many ways to evaluate a measure as to whether they meet these criteria, but essentially you want a measure that's very granular and can capture small changes. And so you see my little ruler here, if you wanna measure growth, say um, in a young child, do you want to measure that with, you know, foot by foot, or do you want to be able to focus in um, on smaller increments? And, and we want to focus in on smaller increments. And this also means that you want a broad range. So that's exactly what we were talking about with the ORCA just a moment ago. Uh, we don't want floor effects. We don't want ceiling effects. We want the measure to be very inclusive of all ability levels. So here, is our battery of measures in Simon's searchlight. And so I won't go through reading everything here, but essentially we collect medical information. Currently that's by interview. We collect information on sleep with a standardized measure and also a measure developed by sleep experts. Um, seizure history, development through the Vineland, um, behavior measures, and finally the more patient-centered measures uh, for what the parents tell us they would like to tell us about. So that's quality of life um, and um, we develop the voice of the community. These are our plans for new measures, new outcome measures in the coming year. And you can see the ORCA is on here. So we were really excited to hear the presentation about the ORCA today and where that's going. Um, so what we're trying to do here is improve our battery. Not all of our measures are true outcome measures technically. Um, there's a lot of guidance um, in FDA and out in the literature about how to select good outcome measures, how to develop them. Um, and so I want to just be clear that not all of our measures have met all criteria for sensitivity to change or, or all of these things that we want, but we're moving there, we're moving toward that. And we're designing our battery in consultation with, in alignment with other rare disease registries and other natural history studies and researchers in this space. And um, so I give a lot of credit to them, um, including grin 2 b uh, for being able to help us with um, what's important to families to measure. So um, here, we're just really trying to get more inclusive with our measures. That's what you're seeing here. The PDCAT permits um, mobility devices. The ORCA permits um, alternative means of communication. Uh, which our other measures didn't. And we want to add behavior measures and look at their interaction with different treatments in history. Okay, so first we're going to show some data briefly for the patient-centered outcomes, the voice of the community and quality of life. So voice of the community we authored um, based upon other registries. This is the first step in patient-focused drug development. Um, is getting uh, a sense, the, the voice of the patients themselves, the families themselves, and what's important, what's critical, critical to treat and critical to, to measure and follow over time. Um, and so um, I will show you a little bit of what we heard here. Um, very similar to the GRIN family survey for, for your roadmap, and very similar to the results of that survey, what came out on top for most frequently reported symptoms, we have intellectually intellectual disability or developmental delay, fine motor delay, speech language delay, and hypotonia. 
and then as you see many other symptoms, but those were the very top and these range to 60 to 99% of um, our group. Um, the data I'm showing today, uh, by the way, it, it was labeled grin to b but I should call it out. I'm showing grin to b only because that is where we have the most data so we can begin to look for patterns and trends. Um, we would love to have more voices from our other GRIN conditions. Today, I, I'm able to show GRIN to be. Um, symptoms reported by caregivers as having the greatest impact on life are intellectual disability, developmental delay, um, communication delays, limited communication. So this is consistent. Um, the most challenging in terms of everyday life are independence in self-care, learning activities, and again, communication. And the most important targets for drug treatments that were reported by caregivers were to improve this ability to learn, um, improve communication again, and certain aspects of behavior. Now our quality of life measure. I wanted to point out this quality of life measure, quality of life inventory disability, authored by Jenny Downs of Telethon Kids in Australia. We loved this measure and we implemented it because it was developed with families. It was developed with parents of children with neurogenetic disorders. So that's extremely important. We also like how it covered positives. It was very inclusive. It, it covered aspects of life um, that many children can participate in. And I'm not going to go through all of the findings here, but you can get a sense of basically the, the type of coverage that this measure provides. Okay, and in terms of measuring development, we do use the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scales. The Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scales, um, if used properly, for research and if administered properly, there are certain subdomains on it that are actually quite good in terms of its broad range and avoiding um, floor effects or basement effects as we heard earlier. Um, for example, and I'll show you the data, expressive communication domain. Um, what it's not good at is exactly what the ORCA will do, which is um, alternative means of communication. So the use of AAC devices, for example. And then also it does not cover the use of mobility devices. So allowing us to measure other ways that children are moving around or communicating with us. And that's very important. So we're implementing ORCA and PETACAT to cover those bases. However, I will show you, if you look at the um, expressive language data that we have, this is the expressive communication subdomain. And what we've done is constructed growth charts. This is basically like a growth chart when you're measuring increase in, let's say, height over time. So if you're looking along the bottom here, reading from left to right, you're seeing the ages go up. And so what we want to look at now, if you look at each individual plotted as a point, and again, Dr. Bain showed this earlier, each individual plotted as a point on the graph, we want to see as they're aging up, are their skill levels going up? So on this scale on the y-axis, you're seeing basically um, what we call a mental age equivalent. And so um, one of the takeaways that we have here very briefly is that if you look at children over age two, when you'd expect some communication to be developing, over half the children above age two are at the level roughly we can estimate that they are learning or, or already using some language. And we do this by deriving, basically back deriving um, from the mental age, looking at what items are required to get that score on the Vineland. And then we can figure out, okay, these kids here at this level about little between age um, or the age level of one and two, um, that those that is the level at which you can begin to use single words. And then above that, um, a little over um, the two-year-old level, you're using um, some simple questions and, and on from there. And so the other good thing to notice there is that for our children um, in grin to be after age 12, half of them have developed more complex functional language. That is really good to see. Um, and so one of the things that we want to do that I should note going forward, and we hear you parents because parents have asked us, we want to begin to tie 
these points to, okay, what are the interventions that are happening? Or what are the seizure complications happening? Or what is the function or type of variant specifically that we can link to these different levels to um, start to make connections and what determines outcomes? So that's something we're going to be looking at as we have more and more individuals to study. Here's personal care over time. Um, and so again, this is, I should point out um, for researchers in the audience, this is cross-sectional data, not yet longitudinal, um, truly longitudinal. And so what that means is this is a snapshot showing different children who are all different ages and we're plotting them. And that's very similar to how you would do a growth chart. Um, what we want to do now is we're switching to the Vineland 3 and the Vineland 3 will be online and it also permits the use of growth scale values. And um, that way you can compare um, over time individuals growth. And so then we'll really be able to see more objectively what kids are able to do and what adults are able to do as they age up. What we see here in personal care very briefly is that children with GRIN2B, individuals with GRIN2B do need support. There are some teens here that um, have been able to develop the ability to take care of basic needs. And in terms of gross motor, not everyone is um, represented here, um, but, um, and that's because of age, but um, essentially if we focus on um, folks over age two, because that's when we're expecting more development, over half are at the level where they could be walking independently. So their scores, on this measure are indicating they, they have very likely hit the level of walking. And so that's also very important to know. Okay, in terms of measuring behavior and sleep, um, we use the child behavior checklist. And the child behavior checklist, there are many ways you can look at the data. This is a little bit difficult to look at, but it's super interesting. This is true longitudinal data. Each line is a child. And in some cases, we have children with five time points. So we're able to look at what's happening with them. Are they um, increasing their scores over time? These are standard scores. Um, are they increasing, meaning that their emotional or behavioral concerns are um, getting more challenging over time? Or are they decreasing, which means that they seem to be getting better over time? Um, and so overall, there's a lot of variability here, but I think what's interesting, again, it's a very small number, but if you look like here about, you know, maybe 11 and up, um, I would say that our teens are pretty stable and, you know, we're not seeing super significant um, concerns. We label them significant and mild. Um, and for those of you who might use the CBCL here, um, significant corresponds to what's considered the clinical level, so clinically significant. Um, borderline is on the borderline and, and not quite so, so milder concerns. And this graph showed specifically emotional concerns, so that would be things like anxiety or crying. Okay, now we did the same thing here. I should say Dr. Holbrook did this same thing here by plotting um, children and following them um, some from a toddlerhood um, up into um, elementary age. And again, we have some kids with five time points, as I said. These are behavioral concerns such as, such as aggression and acting out. And um, we do see here, there could be a trend where if you see these lines are pointing up, we might be seeing some reports of increasing concerns about behavior and acting out with age. Um, and again, good news is things seem to be pretty stable in our teens. So that's good news, right? Um, so this is a way, this is more of what we wanna do. And this is the beauty of a longitudinal study is that we're able to plot over time and plot individuals and start to look for trends and give this information back to families. Okay, and very briefly, finally, this is our, our last measure I'm showing. We also uh, measure sleep with the children's sleep habits questionnaire. And what you're seeing here is the percentage of children included that met criteria for having a possible clinical sleep problem or a, a sleep disorder. Um, and so 
you know, the proportions are quite high here. So we know that sleep is, is indeed a complaint by, by parents. So finally, I will show you for the researchers out there, this is how to access all of this data. This is free. You can come on base.safari.org and um, fill out a, a simple application and um, you can gain access. We also have biospecimen. Um, and so we welcome researchers. You're also welcome to find me, contact me, and um, we can help walk you through. And here is a thank you to the families. Um, our deepest thanks for participating. Um, and, and this message is from our Voice of the Community survey, but our thanks go for participation across the board in all of the history and information you've given us. Thank you. And, and thanks to everyone for having us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Snyder. That was great. Um, so it looks like most of the questions have been answered in the chat at this point by some of the folks over at Simon's. Let me see if I see any questions for Molly. Oh, there was a question uh, for Molly in terms of a reference for uh, the study that you were talking about um, and if the tool is available for speech therapists or developmental pediatricians, presumably um, the ORCA. Yeah, so the tool is, uh, is available and it can be uh, requested for use. Um, we have partnered with Pattern Health, which is a group to help us just um, keep track of who requests the measure. So you can go on their um, website to request a copy of the measure um, just to see what it looks like. And then um, we are in the process of publishing our data from both Angelman syndrome. And um, we also worked with um, the RET, a group called the with Rett syndrome. So we're looking to publish both of those groups of data. Perfect, thank you. Um, there looks like there's another question in the chat in regards to um, the l serine trial that Dr. Garcia Corzorla is putting on. Um, and she has included many of the measures that Molly talked about earlier. Um, and, but I also think she is developing a grin scale. And this person wanted to know if there's any link to the work of Simon's. Um, and the ORCA. Based on what I know about the study, I would say I think this is a separate project that she's putting on. Yes, I think so too. Um, but I think that, that the ORCA is very new. And so we are looking to, um, like, we're always looking to gather more data and sort of, you know, I think our eventual goal would be to have some sort of like PRO Rosetta Stone across measures, um, but that is many, many years in advance. But I'll let Dr. Greensteiner talk. Um, yep, I don't, I don't have a lot to add. I'm not involved in that particular project. We'd be happy to to help in however, whatever way we can. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for your time. We greatly appreciate um, your presentations that were given today. And